Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. It is a wonderful day, especially and particularly today, when many people the world over are gathered to mark the birth of Christ. And just a few notes before I go to the prayer. Just on the Swahili hymns, the second hymn, Waimba Sikizeni, is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I don't think we have sung it here before in Swahili. <clears throat> but it is a song, of course, not only calling the angels to sing to the Lord, but calling the congregation to join the angels to sing together to the Lord who has taken on body. Just um, <clears throat> also the fifth hymn, Johnny Kwafuraha, O Come All Ye Faithful. Just want to focus on the second stanza. <clears throat> I can imagine those who translated this to Swahili had quite a task. God of God, light of light. That is in the Athanasian Creed. Confessing Christ to be God, but belonging to God. And light, but not of lesser radiance or glory than the Father. So, mungu wa mungu, mwanga wa mwanga. Amekua radhi kuzaliwa mungu wa kweli. Wala si kiumbe. He is not a creature. He is God incarnate. God in flesh. And then the last stanza. Ewe buwana muema tuwa kubarikia. Yesu utukufu uwe wako. Referencing the buwana there is Yesu. And then neno la baba. The word of God. We, we know these phrases in English. Christ is the word, right? Yes. So the word taken on flesh. And that is, these are great confessions. They are found in our confessions of faith in the 1689. They are found in our creeds, beginning with the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene and the Athanasian creeds, all the seven creeds that we confess together as a body of believers. These are truths that are found there. And of course, they are drawn directly from scripture, because God of God, light of light, uh, just to reference one scripture, is Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 4. And you find there very great Christology showing the divinity of Christ. In fact, the whole first chapter of Hebrews really talks about the divinity of Christ as opposed to prophets and even angels, as the writer of Hebrews is speaking. And so as we sing these hymns, the point is, they are Christmas carols, and there are many people that will be singing them today. I pray that they understand the significance of the words that they sing. But even more so, you here, because you are the ones that have come here to Pendle Gospel Community Church. I don't know, I usually see this uh, hymn... Uh, brochures being left, I would encourage you to carry the brochures. Just go and read through the songs, learn them. You can, they, are, they are readily available on YouTube. You can find them. But just to learn where these particular portions we sing from come from in the Bible. Because if they don't come from the Bible, we have no use singing them here. Again, we thank God for giving us this day, this Chris, well, it's Christmas Eve. It's the day before Christmas. But uh, since we won't be having a service tomorrow, this is our Christmas service. And so today in particular, we are gearing everything towards the birth of Jesus Christ. But again, not, a, not as the world does, uh, either commercially or just giving uh, lip service to the birth of Christ. We want to See the significance of Christ. And I'm saying this before we begin the preaching and as we head into prayer, just to remind you that we need to pray for the Jews. Again, in the state of Israel, there is still that conflict with Hamas, that terrorist group. And the Jews and the Palestinians, of course, don't see eye to eye. Yet I must remind you once again, as I do almost every other Sunday, that Christians in both regions are suffering because the Jews greatly despise the Christians, and the Muslims from Palestine, or the Palestinian side, greatly despise the Christians there. And so Christians are despised from both ends, and we need to pray 
for believers. As we sang this fourth hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and perhaps you saw there it referencing Israel. Uh, rejoice, rejoice. <clears throat> Emmanuel shall, co shall come to thee, O Israel. Israel there is the church. It's not the state of Israel. It's the people of God, whether they are in Israel or in Kenya. We must rejoice because Emmanuel has come. And of course, it's also referencing the second coming of Christ. But this is a song that we would wish our Christian brethren in those afflicted areas would sing. Ukraine, Russia, as the Greek Orthodox Church or the Russian Orthodox Church continues to persecute them. In China, in various parts of Africa, such as Sudan and the northern parts of Africa, we need to pray for believers in all these regions. And even here in Kenya, geographically speaking, only the southern and western parts of Kenya in general have what you'd call a sufficient <laughs> presence of Christianity. If you go to the northern parts, whether you're going to the northwest or the northeast, or the southeast along the coast, there's very little Christian witness. In fact, it probably ends somewhere near Isiolo in central Kenya. So we need to pray even for fellow Kenyans, and we therefore need to not only support missions that people that go out, qualified men and women that go out there, but pray that God would raise some from amongst us to be able to serve these peoples. And then finally, we'll be praying for the needs of our church. Quite a number of members again are missing, and this is characteristic of December. <laughs> people will travel a lot. So we'll pray for the various members who are not there uh, today, uh, Chris and his family uh, who traveled to Eldoret and then now they arrived in Naivasha yesterday safely. We'll pray for them. We'll pray uh, for Peter and his wife. We'll pray for Joy Wamboy uh, and, and the various members who uh, have not been able to, to, to join us. Uh, Priva is uh, still in Kisumu. Uh, he's, they're still continuing with field work. That God would sustain them, keep them, and assure them wherever they are. I'm sure that they are looking for godly biblical churches around them. Uh, we also pray for our needs. God bids us to cast our cares and our sorrows to, to him, financial and material needs. These are realities that face us, and everyone has financial needs. And so we we'll pray that God would be able to meet our needs in accordance with his will and grant us contentment in our state. And then finally, we'll pray for the word of God, the preaching of God's word. We'll pray that God would enable all of us to understand his word and that would apply to our very own lives. And so let us go before this God in prayer. Our dear heavenly Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, indeed, we thank you that your great plan of salvation has unfolded. It unfolded for us, humanity, who abandoned you and we fell into sin. We thank you that you've provided Christ. And this is the first thing that we must thank you for. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus Christ was born as a human being by a human, uh, a human mother. We thank you that he grew up as some of us do, sharing with us the troubles of this world, living and serving, showing us how we ought to live, to be conformed to his image and pattern. And we thank you that chiefly he went to the cross willingly as you sent him, and he died. We thank you even more that he resurrected from the dead. That Jesus Christ is not only risen, he is exalted and reigning reigning at your right hand as you make his enemies his footstool. So we thank you that we have Christ as a church. We are the bride of Christ. We are called by his name. That there is no one and nothing that can threaten the church. Indeed, we can be threatened outwardly, but no one can break the church because Christ promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. And so we want to pray for many Christians that are it's passed around the world. Christians in China and various parts of Asia, in Iran, where they are not allowed to meet, in parts of the Middle East, in Yemen, 
as conflict continues to brew in that region. And even in the silent Middle Eastern nations such as Saudi Arabia and Oman and United Arab Emirates, there is still some level of suppression. And so we pray for believers in these nations. We ask, Lord, that you might encourage and assure them even as they undergo persecution. We want to pray for Christians in Ukraine and Russia as those two countries continue to war against one another, seeing loss of life, uh, go beyond 500,000 men who have lost their lives in this battle, in this war. We ask, Lord, that you may protect the Christians that are there in Russia that are continuing to be persecuted and suppressed by the Russian Orthodox Church. We want to ask, Lord, that you might remove those who stand in the way of your gospel and your people. We want to pray for the Ukrainians that are dispersed around the world who escaped their nation because of the ravages of war, particularly. We want to remember those that attend Lausanne Free Church in Switzerland, about 50 Ukrainians. And we ask, Lord, that you may be with them and encourage them, may that church and many other churches that have received Ukrainians and people that are escaping war, may they be of benefit to these people, these fellow beloved brothers and sisters. We want to pray not only for Christians in that region, we remember the conflict that is happening in the state of Israel uh, between Hamas and uh, the Israel Defense Forces. Lord, it is easy to get entangled emotionally in some of these things. Yet, your people belong to you because of Christ. So we want to pray even for the Jews this day, and particularly those who think that they can hide behind their religion, or behind the fact that they are born in Abraham's line. Lord, would you convict them of their sin? Would you show them their idolatry? Would you show them as Christ did in John 8, that everyone who does not submit to him belongs to the devil? Lord, would you convert these Jews, that they may recognize this man who came as a Jew, the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may see him as Messiah and worship him. And we will not only pray for the Jews, we pray for the Palestinians as well, particularly those in Hamas. Lord, we ask that you would break the hearts of these men. And if they will not submit, Lord, would you remove them out of the way? We ask, Lord, that you might have mercy on the various peoples of Palestine who continue to suffer despite everything that is going on. Those who do not support one side or another but find themselves victims, direct victims of the war particularly the Christians there, both in the state of Israel and in uh, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Would you be with them, Lord? Would you encourage them? Would you help them? Uh, maybe they might not be able to meet because of war. Wherever they are, Lord, would you help them not to despair, but to know your presence, particularly by going to your word or remembering your word in their hearts and being encouraged this day. Lord, we want to pray even for people in various African nations who continue to suffer the ravages of war. And particularly, we want to pray for our country here, Kenya. There are many that are yet to hear about Christ. And we ask that you may challenge the churches here to preach the true gospel and in effect to send the true gospel out into various parts of this country. In the north and eastern region that border Somali and the regions that border Ethiopia and South Sudan and Uganda, Lord, these regions are yet to hear of Christ. Would people be encouraged and emboldened to preach Christ as we sing in that great reformation hymn to abandon kindred and goods and this life also because Satan may kill the body but he will never touch the soul which belongs to you. Indeed, your kingdom is forever. We thank you, Lord, that even this little church here, Upendo Gospel Community Church, you have sustained us throughout the last two years. You have kept us. You have continued to show your wonders of grace to us, both individually and collectively as a church. We have seen how uh, you have purified your church. We have seen how uh, you have caused us to grow together, to love one another. We ask, Lord, that you may continue to keep us even as we complete this year. And we pray, Lord, that you may in particular provide for us materially, even as you have spiritually. 
all of us suffer in one way or, or the other, especially in these hard economic times. We suffer one way or the other financially, and we ask, Lord, that you might provide for our needs, that we might meet our needs. Uh, some of us need to pay rent. Some of us need to pay school fees. Some of us need food. But for the various and diverse needs, we ask that you might provide in accordance with your will. May we not mama and complain against you when we lack, but would you help us to be content with our state and like Paul to say that we have learned how to abound and how to lack. We have come to hear the preaching of your word and this spiritual food, Lord, you have not kept from us. We have been meeting here freely and we continue to meet. We thank you for providing this place that we meet in. We thank you that you have given us the willingness to come and hear your word. Would you help me to speak with unction and authority and boldness and clarity as I speak to your people, as I bring your word? And would you help them to listen in by faith? Would you remove all barriers and obstacles that would be in the way of them hearing your word and understanding it? And would you help us all to apply this word in the coming week? Even as we come to hearing your word, this is how you have committed your word to the preaching, to the foolishness of preaching. And so as I preach your word, may Christ be glorified. As we learn about his birth and particularly how he fulfills the law in the birth, in his birth. May this help us indeed to be humble and obedient as Christ was. This is our prayer. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Let us turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Luke, Luke's Gospel. Chapter 2. Is Luke one of the companions of the apostles, particularly the apostle Paul? Luke, just to remind you, was a physician, what today we'd call a doctor, medical doctor. And he was very meticulous in how he kept his records. So if you turn to chapter 1 of Luke, verses 1 to, to 4, Luke 1, verses 1 to 4, and this is just to give you an idea of what Luke is, or how Luke deals with his issues. He says, Inasmuch, and I'm reading from the King, New King James Version, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So here is Luke um, writing an orderly account and He's, he's, he's a very detailed man, he's very organized, and he's getting his sources from the various eyewitnesses. Now, we tend sometimes to read the Bible as if it's not a historical book. Let's turn quickly again to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I promise you this just to help you understand that as we go into this account, this happened in history. This is not, um, you know, theology divorced from history. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm reading. Now this is the Apostle Paul, who was the companion of Luke. Listen to Paul from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, and by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some has, have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Now you see, Paul there is describing, he's giving the evidence of the things that he is speaking about. He's declaring to you that which he received and that which is according to the scriptures, but not divorced from history and evidence of the people, the eyewitnesses that saw the things that are written for us and our edification. And Luke is doing the same thing here. He is writing this account to Theophilus. So Luke's first book was this Gospel of Luke. His second book was the, was the, the book of the Acts of the Apostles. So the book of Acts is still written by Luke. It's a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. He's writing a very detailed and historical account. And he's saying that he's not the only one that has written. So there are uninspired works. Some of them that we know are written by men such as Josephus, although he comes way later. But there are other men that wrote some of these accounts. Some of them wrote accounts without going to the actual source. And so some of those details are not very clear. But we are assured that God's word has no error. And so God preserved that which was without error and authoritative for us as we go here to the book of Luke. And as I said, we're going to Luke chapter 2. Last year but one, in 2021, December, Christmas, the Christmas service then, I did Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. And so we looked at the birth of Christ we looked at the historical context of Caesar Augustus. Uh, Caesar Augustus' real name was Octavian. He was the nephew of Julius Caesar. So that's why he took the name Caesar. And then Augustus was a name, a divine name, because the emperors, they dubbed themselves gods <laughs> to be worshipped. So he was Caesar the god, or the awesome one, Augustus. And... So we are told that he had given uh, a decree that there would be a census in all the world. Of course, the, all the world here is only the Roman Empire because that was the world then. There were other regions that the Roman Empire had not touched. Uh, but this is, of course, in the context of those who lived under the Roman Empire. And so Caesar had called for this, and this caused Joseph and Mary, who are residents in Nazareth. Now, once again, I'm just going to require your involvement in this. Just think of Israel as a long rectangle, uh, long vertically, just to make things easier. And then at the very top of that rectangle is Galilee, that whole region called Galilee. If you read of Cana of Galilee, where Jesus did his miracle of changing or turning water into wine, the Sea of Galilee, of course, where Jesus used to go with his disciples and where Peter almost sunk when he doubted. All that, Nazareth, Capernaum, all that is to the north. And then in the middle there is what we call Samaria, Samaria, depending on what accent you use. Samaria was a region of people that, if you go back to the Babylonian exile, and even before that to the Assyrian exile. The Assyrian exile involved the northern kingdom. There was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah. The southern kingdom went to Babylon. The northern kingdom was taken away by Assyria, and they were dispersed throughout the world. Now, the difference is that Babylon did not repopulate Judea. And so when Cyrus, later on, the Persian comes to the throne, the Jews go back to their land. But the northern kingdom was repopulated with other tribes by the Assyrians. And so when those Israelites came back, they found other people dwelling in their houses, title deeds. 
and they could not remove them, and they intermarried with them. And so because they became a mixed tribe, they became Samaritans. And this is why the Jews hated the Samaritans, because they were not pure Jews. And so to be called a Samaritan was an insult. That's why they called Jesus a Samaritan. And so Samaria is in the middle here, and then down you have now the southern kingdom, Judea, what is called Judea, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and cities such as that, Bethany, uh, Beth, uh, Bethsaida or Bethzada is the same name. Uh, they are all to the south. And so for Joseph and Mary to travel, they had to traverse this region called Samaria. Now here's the problem. The Samaritans were not, did not like the Jews at all. And many times the Jews, when they wanted to make a, a journey either from south to north, because remember the Jews are in the north and in the south, and then in the middle you have the Samaritans. So if they wanted to visit family members on the other side, they would not go through Samaria because they really hated one another. They'd go around Samaria. Now they are presented various problems as you went around. There were robbers. And so you have stories such as that of the Good Samaritan. Jesus is giving stories that those people understood. It's difficult for us to understand. But they were highway robbers because some of these paths were not very safe as they traveled. We do not know the route that Joseph and Mary used because we know Jesus Christ as he was going back to Galilee from Judea, he passed through Samaria. So it is possible that they passed through Samaria. Because remember, Mary was pregnant, just about to give birth, and here time was of the essence. And furthermore, Caesar Augustus had given a decree that there would be a census. And so there was a time element here. All that to say that from Nazareth, to Jerusalem was about 150 kilometers. So just think with me, think of say Nairobi to Nyeri uh, or um, just from Nairobi to Gilgil, there about if you use that route, that's about the distance that they needed to cover to go and be registered because they lived in Nazareth but their hometown was Bethlehem. Now why was their hometown Bethlehem? Because Joseph was in the line of David the king. And David was a man of Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. Ordinarily, anyone who came from the Davidic line would go back home. The way, you know, during the holidays, we go back home, Ukienda okay, Usha go. You know, you live in Nairobi, but you go back to where your ancestors came from generally. That's what happened with Joseph. And he was going back to Bethlehem. So th this is just to give us a bit of context as we get into this, because it's important that we understand what is going on. So he's traveling from that very top region to this very bottom region here in Judea, and he has a pregnant wife. And so we need to understand that, and this is why when they come and arrive in Bethlehem, now remember, there are other descendants of David that live not only in Galilee, but in other nations. Some live in Egypt, some live in uh, Syria in the north, some probably live in the east. And so all these are coming back. They're coming back to that little town, Bethlehem. And so it must have been overcrowded. And so when Joseph and Mary arrive, whoo, suddenly there's no room. And so we already looked at that and how Mary had to give birth in basically an animal's stable. Again, an animal's stable, don't think of cartoon stables that are usually clean. Think of the regular stable that you know in Oshago with all that smell. And the manger here is the feeding trough or the water trough. Um, so we, we're basically talking about a very, not a very, not something that you want to be. I mean, you don't even want to be home, uh, especially for ladies who have been in labor. They know you, you don't want to be very far from the hospital because there is comfort there. There are people who know what they are doing and they're going to help you. But here is Mary arriving when there's everything going on, there's a government function, a census is going on. Even doctors have had to travel, the physicians of the day. But Christ was born. This, as we shall see, is to help us see God's sovereign hand. Christ had to be born in Bethlehem. And we see this in Micah 5 too. Because Micah, the prophet, speaks about Bethlehem, a brother. Oh, you little town. 
That's the very passage that the Pharisees used when Herod heard from the wise men. Huh? There's a king of the Jews? Not me? <laughs> Where is he to be born? So he calls the Pharisees and the men of the law, the scribes, and they go to Micah and they tell, yeah, indeed, our, our scriptures speak of a ruler who will be born in Bethlehem. And that's why Herod ensures that he kills. So this was a bit later. Probably Jesus at that time may have been closer to two years old. So he ensures that all children two years and younger to ensure that it doesn't, it probably if you miss the dates, just ensure you kill all children two years and younger. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. So that's the context historically, geographically also that we are dealing with as we look at this passage. So I want to read only five verses, actually four verses. That is Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. And as we read, I've given all that historical and geographical context to help us as we read, understand what the significance of this portion is. It's, it seems like an odd, misplaced portion, especially to preach on Christmas, on a Christmas service. But you're going to see that it is squarely within what God wants us to understand. Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. So this is after the shepherds had gone and visited Mary. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That is the word of the living God. Blessed be his holy name. So we come across here a particular section that deals with those days just after the birth of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, in 2021, when I presented this, I remember I preached a sermon and uh, titled it The King and the Gospel. Because we were looking at the birth of Jesus and why that's significant for us, how that is good news. And therefore, the king being born, the shepherds coming to worship a baby, uh, and so showing that he is God, as we have read, uh, in flesh, God dressed in baby. And we saw that the king is the one who brought his gospel. Now today, we are continuing with that portion, but I want us to see a particular element that I think is it tends to be overlooked when you're looking at the birth of Christ. The king and the law. That is the title of my sermon. The king and the law. And the reason I've titled it that way is because I want us to see how Jesus here begins his obedience. Not as a grown-up, but as a baby. Jesus, when he comes into the world, immediately begins his mission as Messiah. He comes into the world. He's just been born. Of course, we've seen the, the shepherds worshipping him. Later on, we see, we will see uh, uh, Matthew is the one who references this. The wise men who were not particularly three come and worship him still as a child. And then still in this account of Luke, he references that portion where, uh, that, that, that portion of life where Jesus Christ went to the temple at about 12 years of age and he astounded the theologians of the day, the Pharisees, the rabbis. Oh, they were astounded at the teaching of Jesus at 12 years of age. All that to fulfill the active, we call it active obedience of Christ. We call it active because there's also a passive 
obedience of Christ. Those two words, just to explain very briefly, when we talk about the active obedience of Christ, it is that obedience that he himself does and initiates. And then the passive obedience is that which happens to him, but he still obeys when it happens to him, such as the cross. He's not the one who goes and tells the Romans, build a cross for me. Circumstances are such that he is betrayed by someone. So these things are happening from outside of him and affecting him, but his response to them is to obey the mission. He knows he has to die. Whereas the active obedience of Christ is basically those things that he does willingly or he does in a sense to fulfill the laws of God, particularly those that are found in the Mosaic law. I'll cover my sermon, God willing, in three points. Number one, the incarnation. The incarnation, God become flesh, to become incarnate. And then number two, the presentation, because he's presented to the temple by his parents. And then number three, the fulfillment, because he fulfills the law in his incarnation and in his presentation. The incarnation, the presentation, and the fulfillment. Of course, we come to verse 21. What does it say? And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child. That particular phrase there is very important. Now, maybe in some of our cultures, I'd say actually in all of our cultures, because even in the cultures here in Kenya that practice circumcision, they do not practice it for the reason that it was practiced in the scriptures. So we miss the significance of circumcision with reference to the covenant of God. And so when we read, sometimes you find people reading it with their cultural lenses, and they see Jesus circumcised, and they're thinking, ah, he's already bypassed that right. This is not just merely a right. We must understand the circumcision meant a lot to the Jews. This is why Paul makes a big deal about the circumcision and the uncircumcision. When he's saying circumcision doesn't count for anything with regard to the gospel. But with regard to the law, oh, it counts a lot. Why? Because circumcision was given under the law. And so we need to understand that circumcision and the implications that it has here we're going to very quickly see Jesus begins to identify with his people as a baby. Why? Because in circumcision, we are taken back to the covenant of God with that patriarch Abraham, right? God told Abraham that I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I will give you a son. And Abraham thought, ah, the son that I have with Hagar got him. No, from your own loins with Sarah. I'll give you both a son. You will have a son, and that son will grow into a great nation. And he tells him, he makes a covenant with him. God makes various stages of the covenant, which most of them, if not all of them, were initiated by God and fulfilled by God because man, particularly the descendants of Abraham, could not keep the covenant. But God gives Abraham a very peculiar sign to keep as a means of showing him or as a means of showing that he needs to keep the covenant. As a means of identifying him with that covenant, God tells Abraham, every male child that is born in your house, whether he comes from your loins or not, even if that is a slave, even if he comes from another lineage, as long as he is counted in your house, every male child must be circumcised at eight days of age. That is the covenant that God, or rather the sign of the covenant that God gave to Abraham. And so this is the context, the biblical and even the historical context of circumcision if you are to go back to the root, it is because God made a covenant with Abraham regarding the blessing that Abraham would become 
to the world. And so this particular sign of circumcision was very important, redemptively. It was also important to the Jews, but at a particular time it became important for a different reason, a wrong reason. What was the wrong reason that the Jews uh, 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 <clears throat> embraced circumcision? Because the Jews thought that as long as I am counted in the covenant by being circumcised and being likened to Abraham, it doesn't matter what I do as long as I have the sign of the covenant. As long as I am counted as the circumcision, I will make it to heaven. I will be saved. Jesus corrects them in his lifetime. He has very strong words for the Jews. In fact, in John 8, if you go and read that chapter, Jesus tells them openly, you are children of your father, the devil. And the Jews are offended at that. And one of the pleas or one of the proofs that they have that they are not children of the devil is that we are children of Abraham, our father. Why are they referencing Abraham? Is it because of the blood lineage? Not so. It is because of the covenant sign that they had with Abraham, that they were likened to Abraham, that everyone who had that sign of circumcision would be counted in the covenant that God made with Abraham and be called God's friend. And so they say, no, we are, father of our, we are children of our father. Abraham and Jesus says, no, no, no. If you are children of Abraham, your father, you would do the things that Abraham does. And Paul makes that point in Romans chapter 4. And he makes it great. In that entire chapter, he's basically making the point that every believer who has a faith, like that of Abraham, and who has works, and that point again is picked up by James later, like that of Abraham, is the true child of Abraham. And Paul says explicitly that no one is a Jew who is only circumcised outwardly, but a Jew is one who is circumcised inwardly. So we need to see that circumcision to the Jews was a great deal. They prided themselves. In fact, they thought of Gentiles, those who are not in this covenant, as dogs and firewood for the fires of hell. They, they, they did not look at Gentiles as people that they could relate with in any way, only in temporal things of this present age, but not in the eternal things. And so to them, to be a Gentile, to them, was worse than being a dog. That is how heavily they valued their circumcision. And here comes the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jesus comes and fulfills this aspect of circumcision in the right manner. And we're going to be seeing how this is so. He fulfills the law. He comes and he circumcised. First and foremost, God commanded this requirement. It was a legal requirement that anyone born under the Mosaic law in the line of Abraham at eight days of age had to be circumcised. Now to be circumcised meant that the foreskin had to be removed. And it has significations as we, as we shall see. But the point being that every male child had to be circumcised. And so we see here the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilling a vital aspect of the law. He is circumcised. He is initiated into the covenant under the law. What are the implications of that? That Jesus Christ became a slave, humanly speaking and with all reverence, he became a slave of the law. He had to fulfill every other aspect of the law. Being under the Abrahamic, Abrahamic covenant meant that he had to fulfill that particular sign of the covenant of circumcision. He had to fulfill every other aspect, including the ceremonial laws. That was God's plan. I'm not saying that because Jesus could not. I'm saying that because Jesus willingly 
began to obey. What was the other thing that we see here with Jesus? Circumcision. The other reason for circumcision was not just, it was not just to be part of the covenant. This covenant had implications. Circumcision had a significance that was spiritual from way back. And those who are spiritual, even in the old covenant dispensation, understood the significance of circumcision. What was this significance? Because it was the cutting off of the flesh. It was the removal of sin. It was basically a sign of purification as the flesh was removed. It was as if you had been purified, made anew. And so one for one to be circumcised, one was in effect declaring that they were new. They have been accepted into this covenant as purified people. <clears throat> What's the problem with that when we come to Jesus Christ? Because we confess Jesus was born without sin. How then was Jesus being circumcised and was not just merely to put a signature, you know, as it were, and just say, I bypassed that? There was certainly an aspect in which Jesus was identifying with sinners. He began as a baby to be identified with the very things that other sinners were identified with because that covenant required you to be a sinner for you to be circumcised. It meant that before you were uncircumcised and therefore unpurified and unaccepted. Otherwise, Jesus did not need to be circumcised. If he was in essence, and of course he was in truth already accepted, he is the Lord. <clears throat> but any man was born and circumcised under the Mosaic law and who kept in uncircumcision was an outcast. He was a sinner, not to be accepted into the assembly of God's people. Remember, Israel was an assembly like a church. This was a nation that had been told to set itself apart because they were a holy nation, a peculiar people. And circumcision was a great deal in that. And here is Jesus being circumcised to be identified with the peculiar people of, people of God, not because he was a sinner, but because he is fulfilling all righteousness. What equivalent do we have with this circumcision of Jesus in his later life? The baptism of Jesus. What does baptism have to do with? It has to do with signifying, because it is a symbol, the purification of sin. It is basically saying, I have died to sin and resurrected to godliness. So why did Jesus need to be baptized if again we confess he was sinless from birth, from conception? Because Jesus, as he told John the Baptist, remember, even John the Baptist says, it's not, I can't baptize you. You're the one who should be baptizing me. But Jesus says, let us do this that we may fulfill all righteousness. And here is Christ fulfilling all righteousness because he's about to be a missionary to the circumcision, to the Jews. And he's identifying with the house of Israel. And so he here is circumcised. And therefore, he legally and in the right way, just like we confess Jesus did not need to become a human being. Why be born as a baby? Did God need to put on flesh? No. God the Son would continue to be God the Son had he not put on a body. Because he is God forevermore. Unchangeable. It is for our benefit that God the Son took on a body for himself and was born. And it is the same reason that he was circumcised. It is the same reason that he obeyed. It is the same reason that he was baptized. It is the same reason that he died. He did not need all those things. 
He did not. He did not need to be exalted. He was, is, will forever be the most high. We must see that Jesus in all his actions, all without exception, are done for us. Without exception. And of course, for the glory of God. But we are counted in him because we, who are circumcised in heart, are accounted in his circumcision. That is how we fulfill the law. And that is how the active obedience of Christ, in him doing those things that even if we did can never count before God, matter to us. So we need to understand the act of circumcision served as a visible reminder of the fallen nature of humanity, the need for spiritual purification, but it is also the process of the ongoing process of transformation and renewal that is required for individuals to overcome their sinful nature and be reconciled with God. We must take seriously the words of Christ when he says, if anyone will be my disciple, he must take up his cross, deny his flesh, literally be circumcised to the flesh, Daily and follow me. We must be conformed to his pattern to be like him. And that certainly means that we must undergo some form of affliction or another. Some suffering, some pain. Because circumcision, the removal of the flesh, it is not something that is likable to our nature as sinful human beings. Because at core... I know this has produced controversy before, but at core, that means when we are born as human beings without God, without God's grace, at core, we are sinful creatures. At core. Because we are born in sin. There are no what ifs, because the, the, the rebuttal is that if Adam didn't sin at core, we would be good. But there is no what if in the economy of God. The reality is that we are born sinful creatures and therefore at core we need to confess our sinful nature that needs to be cut off. We need to be circumcised in our hearts. We need the removal of the flesh. That is the only powerful testament to the work of the cross to the birth of Christ even in his active obedience as he here is being circumcised. It might seem as you're reading that, you know, tick by, oh, I read Christ was circumcised and think that has no relation to your life. Oh, it does. It has every relation to your lives. The, the other thing we need to see here with the circumcision of Jesus is the obedience that is presented. The obedience, especially of the parents of Jesus, the human, the earthly parents of Jesus. We must see here Joseph and Mary being obedient to ensure that they followed through with what God had commanded. Remember, this law, for all intents and purposes, seemed like a very old law to them, like it does to us. Because the law regarding circumcision, because it was coded in the Mosaic law, and Moses appears uh, about 1,400 years before Christ is born. And this, that's a very long time. And it's very easy. It would be very easy for someone to say, this, this is a very old law. Why do I need to follow it? Why do I need to follow it to the latter? After all, Jesus can be circumcised later. Why do I have to wait until the eight days are done? I don't circumcise him at birth. Just look at verse 21 and when the eight days were completed. And then look at the latter end of verse 1 and his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before. Gain obedience. Look at verse 22 now when the days of her or their purification, depending on the translation that you have, according to the law of Moses were completed. And then look at verse 23, the reason given as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb 
verse 24, and to offer sacrifice according to what he said in the law of the Lord. Look at the obedience consistently. Now, why do I say consistently? Because when you're reading verses 21 to 24, you might think that is one day. No. Those are about 50 days that are presented there. And this is the problem sometimes with just reading through without studying God's word. We very quickly read, you know, the account of David and Bathsheba. And there are quite a number of people who think that's a one-day event. Uriah coming, Uriah dying, Bathsheba, David, two days, one week. Whereas if you actually took your time to think, <laughs> by the time Bathsheba is getting pregnant, a number of weeks have passed, or probably months. By the time Uriah is coming from the battlefield, by the time he's being sent back, it's a matter that has taken many days. And so there is consistency as you come to this account here in verses 21 to 24 of obedience on the part of Joseph and Mary. Not only in bringing Jesus to be circumcised at the right time, but in Mary observing her purification because when a male child was born according to the law of Moses, a woman had to purify herself for seven days when it was a girl for 14 days. And then to offer again a sacrifice. And the sacrifice had to be either a lamb for those who are wealthy or a pair of pigeons for those who are poor. That should tell you the financial status of Jesus' earthly parents. You had to wait another 33 days to be able to offer that for the firstborn. So if you add up those numbers, they come to quite a great number. A month and a half probably passed by before all this was fulfilled and they waited. And they consistently did it according to the law. And that's the point I don't want to lose. We must see the obedience. We look at those aspects. We must see the obedience of the parents of Jesus here. Now why is it that a woman had to purify herself. Because I, need, I think I, that needs to be addressed very briefly. I won't spend time on this. But the whole idea behind it is because a woman was giving birth to a sinner. <laughs> yes, children are not born holy as God is holy. And so that aspect of giving birth in itself, even though the child is not necessarily the one who has sinned actively, passively, being born with the original sin of Adam. A child had passed through a woman in sin and purification was needed. Again, let me ask, why is this being applied to Jesus Christ who was born without sin? Again, taking you back to the point that Jesus began to identify with sinners at birth, Jesus came for sinners, not for those who are well. Jesus began his mission at birth. We have this idea that Jesus began his mission when he, beg when he began his public ministry. And in a certain sense, he, he did begin it then. But Jesus knew why he came. Even when he was a baby, when humanly speaking, he still had to learn why he came. God in his providence ensured that all things work together, that Jesus would begin his work at birth. The mission of saving his people. And that, no doubt, included the obedience of his parents. Because God chose godly, a godly man and a godly woman to bring Jesus up. To teach him the law. Because this is what here is being implied. That Mary and Joseph were not only people that just lived the way they wanted. These were people that ensured that the law happened when Jesus was born. That it was fulfilled according to the Mosaic law. And that implied that they would bring him up in the ways of God. Teaching him the law. That Jesus would discern at a very young age what his mission was. So we see here, at the circumcision, at the purification, and at the sacrifice, 
Those are three events. We see the parents of Jesus obeying the divine law. But we do not only see the obedience of his parents. We must see that in beginning to fulfill or to obey the law, they themselves, the parents, Joseph and Mary, and Jesus himself, in being subjected to the law, must of necessity fulfill the entire law. So here is one aspect of the law, circumcision, we're dealing with. And then these are the two aspects, the setting apart of the firstborn. And the other aspect of redeeming the firstborn with a sacrifice. These are three aspects of the law that Jesus here is fulfilling, but because he has begun, he must of necessity complete if he is to be the perfect sacrifice for atonement. James tells us that if you follow one, aspect, one part of the law, you must fulfill the whole law. And, and I've, I've given this example, it's not original to me. I've asked people, who think that they can be justified by the law. Have you ever lied? And of course, I've, I haven't found someone who has given any uh, 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 defense. People have said, everyone lies. They are trying to tell you I've lied, but they don't want to say it directly. Say, everyone lies. Have you ever stolen? Even once when you were a child. Ha! Ah, who hasn't stolen anything? What people don't understand is that time does not fix the breaking of God's law. If you have ever lied once, you are a liar. If you have ever stolen once, you are a thief according to God's law. And God's law must not be looked at as discrete parts. God's law is not various rooms that you walk into. This is the room for not killing. That's the room for not lying. The other one is the room for not committing adultery. Think of God's law as one glass. Think of a windshield, a car windshield. If you throw a small stone at that windshield and it breaks, will you tell the owner I'll fix this little part here that has been shattered? Certainly not. You will have to fix the entire windshield, even that part where the stone did not affect. Why? Because God's law is one, united. If you break one aspect, you've broken all of God's law. And if you want to live according to the law of God, which is the point we are making here, if you must fulfill the law of God, you don't fulfill one aspect, you fulfill the entirety of the law of God. This is what made God's law impossible to be fulfilled by any human being. Because every human being tried in one way or the other. We are presented with Abraham. And then he goes to Egypt and the king, the Pharaoh, threatens him. Just the presence of Pharaoh threatens him. Even Pharaoh hadn't said anything. And he tells his wife, when you go in there, say you're my sister so that they don't kill me. Abraham was not trying to protect his wife. He was protecting his own skin. He lied. And Pharaoh finds out when they begin to have all these plagues happening to them, and then suddenly no one is giving birth, wondering what's going on, suddenly it appears to them, is this guy called Abraham, he lied to you, because I saw him playing with his wife, and they were not playing like brother and sister. No one can fulfill, name any saint, and all of them fall flat. Being overburdened by the law of God, that is the state of all human beings until Christ comes into the picture. Because he began to fulfill the law of God, he fulfilled every aspect without fail and therefore went to the cross as a perfect lamb that could bear the burden of God's eternal law on himself for us. That is the gospel. That is the good news for every human being who knows very well if you're asked, have you ever lied? You'd fall, fall down flat on that. And so, Jesus had a debt to fulfill the entire law. And he began to fulfill it. At circumcision, the active obedience of Christ. This J. Gresham Machen 
one of the greatest Presbyterian patriarchs, if you may call him that. He said, he's American, he said, these were his last words on his deathbed. Thank God for the active obedience of Christ. Thank God that all the things I could not be able to do, all the things that I tried and failed in, Christ didn't fail once. In the temptations of Jesus, he did not fail. Jesus never once failed to fulfill the law of God. And then finally, just on this aspect of circumcision, we must see that by undergoing circumcision, Christ demonstrated his human humility and compassion. Now, he has a divine compassion and even a divine, I'll use the word condescension, but here we are referring to his human, remember Jesus is, Jesus is two-natured, yeah? What I mean when I say he's fully and truly man, what I mean to say, or what I need you to understand is that Jesus, like every other human being, had a body and a soul. But I'm trying to explain to you that death, the death of Christ meant that his soul left his body. That's what death is. Death is not the end. Death is simply the separation of soul and body. The body goes to the ground and the soul goes back to God. And with this soul, it is where our faculties, the ones that we talk about, or when you're someone saying the real you, and that's where he is or she is, the soul. It carries the mind, the will, the emotions, the passions, the aspirations, and all the things that flow out of the heart. They are in the soul. And Jesus had a soul. But he also had a body. And then in addition to that, he was truly God. God as the Father is God. And therefore you have John chapter 5, where Jesus says, as you honor the Father, honor me. Because if you do not honor the Son, you do not honor the Father. In the same way you think of the Father as creator, as judge, as governor, think of the son. And so when I talk about his human humility, I'm attributing it to his human nature, but of course he's one person. He can't speak with himself. He's not schizophrenic. We must understand here that his human humility and compassion, though it did not bring down his divine condescension, it did not make him any less God. God is highly exalted. is why he's called the most high. And Christ remained like that even while he abided on earth for 33 years. But we must understand that in his human nature, as he veiled, he did not put away, he only covered or veiled his divine nature, he had great compassion. But again, not exactly like us in the sense that he was without sin. <laughs> so he's truly human, but he's the only true human. Why am I saying he's the only true human? Because human beings were not created to sin. Jesus Christ is the one who came to correct the error, the bug that is in human code. Because human beings, from the very beginning, fell. And as a result, they started going in the direction that God did not intend them to. And I've always told people again, when you're in a mirror and you're looking at yourself, you're looking at your image or your likeness in the mirror, and you're trying to adjust yourself, and you go to the mirror and your image is going away from the mirror, you let her think that mirror is faulty. Or whatever the case, I can't use that mirror, right? Because it's not doing what you want it to do. Your image must, in essence, obey you. And this is what happens with humanity. We are made in the image and the likeness of God. Now God is holy. He expects us to mirror him, to be holy, to be compassionate, to be loving. But like that image in the mirror, we decide to go our own way and do our own thing. Christ had to come and correct that by showing us what it means to be true human. And here he begins in his condescension by beginning to submit to the authority that God placed over him, here being the law of Moses. He was sanctified, purified, and redeemed as a firstborn. 
What does Colossians 2 tell us? <clears throat> it's the book of Colossians. As Paul writes to those in Colossae. Colossians 2, I'll start uh, from verse 8, because this helps us understand this aspect of circumcision as I come to an end on that point. Colossians 2, 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So to verse 9, For in him dwells all all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Anything you can think of God in terms of his power, in terms of his nature, in terms of his governorship, all dwells in Christ bodily. Look at verse 10, connecting us to him. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. And then look at verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of who? Christ. We are counted in him. And it continues on and on. But that's the point that I wanted us to see. We are counted in Christ, in him, in his circumcision. As he obeys God, as he begins to do his, rather, to fulfill God's plan. We, who have been circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands, are circumcised and counted in him who is head over all in whom the Godhead dwells fully. And then what do we see again in verse 21? Back to Luke chapter 2. I'm done, I'm almost done with this point. Luke again, chapter 2. We, we see again in verse 21, when the eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Again, we must see that that is also an aspect of obeying the law that God has given, the divine commands. That, that God had given. I think I made this point at a particular time, that it is parents who have the right to name their children or superiors. And this principle begins at creation. As God creates, he names. And then he calls Adam to come and name because Adam is to be Lord over the earth. And he names the animals and we are told every animal, or rather every name he gave to the animal, that became its name. That is a sign of ownership or superiority that is given either by parents or a superior, and that's why you get to name the things that you own, your property, or your children. Parents are the only ones who have that right. Grandparents can, can't, I mean, uncles, they shouldn't, aunties shouldn't, that's not their place. It's the place only of the parent. And here we are told that it is the angel who told Joseph and Mary what they would name the child. It wasn't really Joseph and Mary who came up with the name, but the true father of the child, the father. He said he must be called Jesus, which is an interesting name because Every name that you find, especially in the Old Testament, has a meaning. And the name Jesus here is not far from that. Because the name Jesus means God is salvation. God is saving. And so in his name, his mission is. And so in him fulfilling the law, in him obeying the authorities set. To him, Jesus, both actively and passively, is doing the will of God in every aspect as a baby. So when you sing about baby Jesus, you know those songs? Baby Jesus, I love you. You are my savior. 
every day. Understand that this is the creator of the world that began to fulfill his mission as a baby. Do not despise those songs. As a baby, he was worshipped. He needed and must needs come as a baby. And he must be worshipped and adored as a baby. Because he, as a baby, has not changed in his divine nature. He is still God forevermore blessed. You must see how important this name is. And, and so that I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but again, having said this, we, we see how Luke later on in the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 12, picks on this name to show how this is the name above every other name. Not only in the selection, but in the use, the utility of this name all the way into eternity, God providentially ensured his name would be above every name. Because of the name of Jesus. Again, we are taken back to Isaiah. Because who in Isaiah says, At my name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. It is Yahweh who says that. And that is applied both by Luke and later by Paul in Philippians chapter 2 to Jesus Christ. It is at his name, it is at his power, his presence, that everyone must obey. But here is the one who compels all creation to obey, to kneel down to him, to show obedience, whether willingly or unwillingly, obeying the full aspect of the law. Who are we? Who are we? Who think that we can bypass particular aspects of God's word and live as we please and obey as we want when God in flesh humbles and condescends himself, coming low to obey the law, even, as we are told in Philippians 2, to the point of a shameful death, naked on a cross. Brothers and sisters, salvation is found in the perfect obedience of Christ. Not your own. It is him that you must look to and the acts that he has done for you. Secondly, I want to Go quickly through the second and the third point. My time is far gone. The presentation. And there are aspects that I have already mentioned here. But here we have the, pres uh, the, 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 the earthly parents of, of Jesus presenting him to the temple in verse 22. And, and this practice, again, is not something that is happening arbitrarily. This is a practice that is squarely rooted in Scripture. Because this is a practice rooted in what was commanded in Exodus chapter 13 verse 2. And also Exodus chapter 22 verse 29. And also Exodus chapter 34 verse 19. That every firstborn, every male who opens the womb must be set apart for God. Now why, why would God say that? Why... Why would they tell people the, the first male that comes out of the womb? We, we have to put ourselves a bit into that context of Old uh, Testament world where a man, you know, in those days, unlike in today where things are a bit easier, you had to have a man to protect you. You had to have a man to inherit from you. You had to have a man to give you land if you needed land. And, and so... Male children were precious generally in that context. Now, in the Jewish culture and tribe, male children were important for another reason as well, an additional reason. The Messiah would be a man, and every woman hoped to give birth to the Messiah. And so, male children were, in that sense, 
treasured. And here's God saying, every male who opens your womb is mine. Give him to me. And you know, you're a mother there and you're thinking, what? Just given birth to this boy. And you know, you really treasure that. Of course, God, in essence, is calling for what is precious to you to come to him. Now, is this what happened throughout the course of Israel? Not exactly, because God, in his mercy and grace, knowing, of course, people would corrupt that system, provided a way for you to redeem that firstborn that belonged to him. So every firstborn belonged to God, not because you gave him, but by right. This was... Whether you wanted to or not, they belong to God. And it was not just for the children, it was also for the cattle, it was also the first fruits of your, uh, of your, of your uh, uh, crops. So it was fast in all things. Everything that comes, you know, imagine your first salary, that belongs to God. Uh, so I'm not saying that you give your first salary, I'm only giving an, an idea of what God intended or meant that we can be able to understand today. All firstborn were owned by God. And you have here Mary in obedience to that law taking Jesus whom she knew was not born in any way like any other human being. She had had the angel and she had witnessed the pregnancy being a virgin. And so here is Jesus being born and she takes him to the temple to present him to God as an offering. But here is where the turtle doves come in because God presented a redemption price that you could give to redeem the firstborn. In essence, to take them back, but that had to cost you, <laughs> in essence. And so what people would give for that was the lamb. You'd provide a lamb to redeem your firstborn. Now, why was this law given by God? I, I, I referenced Exodus 13 to Exodus 22 because they reference the event of Egypt. What happened to the Egyptians when they held the Israelites as slaves? What happened to their firstborn? God took every firstborn from Pharaoh's house to the lowest slave of every Egyptian who did not have the blood of the lamb. All this is not coincidence. This is God's providence speaking to us in picture format that here your child must be redeemed by a lamb. You must sacrifice a lamb to receive back life. This is exactly what Abraham went through with Isaac, whom God called his only child, told him to go to Mount Moriah. And Isaac went willingly, because we are, we are to think of him, many think of him as a child, he was about 33 years of age, and they are going with Abraham to Mount Moriah, and as they go up the mountain, Isaac is saying, I can see the fire, I can see the wood, but why is the sacrifice? Of course, Abraham didn't tell him. <laughs> Told him, the Lord will provide. And that's exactly what happened as Abraham lifted up his knife to strike Isaac. God told him, stop, I see that indeed, you love and obey me. And God provided a ram there that Abraham could sacrifice. But the point is that this is consistently how God has been speaking in covenant picture form in the Old Testament, preparing his people for the coming of the son who will actually die. Look at God's grace in preserving the joy the relief, the hope of his people by presenting a redemption prize for them to be able to receive back their firstborn. That they would be theirs. That they, were, they had been offered to the Lord and here is a legal way according to the law that they would get back the firstborn by providing a lamb. And of course this is a picture of the innocence of that lamb which had not committed sin and as it was being taken to be slaughtered, your sins as it were were transferred to that lamb so that as the lamb died, as the blood was shed, it was as if your blood for the sins that you had committed that had been transferred to that lamb 
died with that lamb. Well, of course, here we don't find a lamb. We find a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And it is God who again in his grace had provided a way for those who economically could not provide for themselves a lamb. Because again, because lambs were quite precious in that system, they cost quite a bit. And poor people could not always afford a lamb. So God provided a way for them to come with these two birds that in the law of Moses were clean birds. Now, sometimes when you're reading Leviticus, especially you come across this section of clean animals and clean animals, and you wonder, what does all this have to do with anything? It has to do with the fact that clean animals in general are a type of the sacrifice that Christ would give being that because he obeyed all things and did not sin, he was presented as a clean sacrifice. And here are two young pigeons in Christ's life, being a type of him, offered for him. And so, referencing that portion of Egypt and that the firstborn of Israel was delivered, was in essence not put to death. Christ was offered to God. But this is not just symbolically. We know that Christ is the one who actually died. That you and I would be redeemed from death. And, and Christ is the story of redemption. Under the law, as a child, he begins to fully, fully obey every aspect of God that is connected to his mission as Messiah. And so it's easy to read through these sections and just bypass them and think they have no relation to you. But we must see here that in the redemption of this firstborn, because he was redeemed under the Mosaic law, he had to fulfill every aspect of the Mosaic law that he would die so that we would not be under the law. That is grace. To know that I have been set free from fulfilling those things that I know full well I could never, ever fulfill because of Christ and his obedience to the law, his circumcision, his presentation in the temple. All these are aspects that point to his saving grace that applies directly to me. This is why I must read this section here with joy. We must see here the presentation of Christ, the child, showing his and emphasizing his dedication to God. He is dedicated fully to God and he is taken by God as his son under the Mosaic law, remember. Now remember that God in truth has only one begotten son, even at this point, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... Here is type and reality happening together, dancing together as the type is being fulfilled in the reality of Christ. This also serves as a foreshadowing of the role of Jesus who was to be the sacrificial lamb, as I've said, who was to die, who was presented for our sins. And Jesus' perfect sacrifice is accessible to all because of that point that I said in point one of circumcision, he identifies with his people. I'll go straight to the third point because of time. We have seen that the law's requirement was that Jesus had to go through circumcision. He had to be presented to the temple. 
The sacrifice had to be given, or rather the redemption price, had to be given for him. And all this pointed to the obedience of Christ. And this showed the deep, godly reverence of Joseph and Mary. We must see that Jesus fulfills the law in himself as a person. He redeems humanity because he was born, because he was circumcised, because he was presented to the temple, because he obeyed every little aspect of the law. And there were about 640 of them without fail without deviating, without distorting, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law for you and I. And this is why when he's asked by the Jews, what must we do to do the works of God? He tells them, if you want to do the works of God, do this. Believe in the one he sent. That is our response to the active obedience of Christ. It is not trying to match his actions so that we also go and be circumcised. We also go and, you know, be presented in a Jewish temple. That is not how we respond to Christ and the great works that he began to do as an infant. It is by believing that everything Christ did, every action we read regarding him, from his birth to his death counts for me forever. That is why, as I say, J. Gresham Machen could, 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 could rejoice and say, thank God for the active obedience of Christ. We are saved because he obeyed. It's not that we have to disobey to make the point. But all I'm saying is that it's not your obedience. It is not you in the pattern in which you are like Christ, say, in humility and compassion that God is so pleased in, per se. But it is in what Christ already did for you, sanctifying the very things you do. And so our baptism, for instance. Why is our baptism sanctified? Why is our baptism Precious before God's sight because Christ was baptized. And as he was baptized, he fulfilled all righteousness for us. And so our baptism counts as Christ's baptism as well before God. Why is your obedience or why are your works treasured, precious before God? Oh, it is not because you know how to do your work so well. That's not what pleases God. God testifies to one and one only. It is one that he says, this one is he in whom I am pleased. And it is not you. It is Christ. So that in him obeying, in him living, in him fulfilling the law, you and I please God. That is the basis of our salvation, our love, our joy, our glorying and boasting should only be in Christ. But it must be fully in Christ. That is the point I want us to understand. It's very easy to say it's only in Christ, but you only glory in his death. And forget his life, forget his birth, forget his active obedience as well. We must glory in Christ and therefore we must study Christ. Our, our minds should be occupied with how Jesus lived, what he did, what he said, what happened to him. Because all that matters to us and for us forever. It is because of that that we can be able to hope for an eternal life. Not an eternal life just of many years in the new heavens and new earth, but an abundant life. One that is full. One where we will have no obstacle in obeying God's law. One where we will have no sin as a barrier causing us to be unwilling or unable to fulfill God's law. It is because of Christ. Christ 
should be our morning and evening song. He should be our all in all. This is why we must sing, as we're going to be seeing after this, glory, glory to our King. He alone deserves the glory and none other. And that glory must be one that we focus intently upon as we see him, the king, the king of creation and the head of the church. And that means your head, your Lord. And as I've always said, if the head floats, the body will survive. He is the king of the law as well. And he fulfills the law fully, perfectly, in a manner that pleases God so much so that he testifies of him publicly. And so we can glory in our king. I'd encourage you, brothers and sisters, as you interact with people from tomorrow, today, Christmas Eve, and people talk about Jesus. On the one hand, do not despise the little things that people say about Jesus. By little things, I mean those things that you think are insignificant. Yeah? It's very easy to think baby Jesus is just for Sunday school children. It's for us as well. Jesus had to be a baby just as he had to be an adult. But on the other hand, we must beware the temptation of making Jesus trivial in this way. By giving him lip service and saying we glory in him, whereas our minds are occupied in other things. By not focusing the entirety of our affections and will and passions to knowing and being known by this one who came to die for us. This one who was born for us, lived under the law for us, as Paul says in Galatians, and freed us from the letter of the law that kills, not because it is bad, but because we cannot fulfill it. Thank God for the active obedience of Christ. Let us pray. Indeed, our Heavenly Father, how glad we are even coming to you before you in prayer, thanking you that we can Worship you because of Christ, what Christ has done. That these are not things that we just fantasize about as if they will never happen. These are not what ifs, but what has already happened. You demonstrated your love for us. And you demonstrated how you will glorify your name as we benefit. By sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. By him coming, living for us. Fulfilling every aspect of the law for us. Dying for our sins. Raised for our justification. And reigning as we reign with him in the heavenly places. Even as we look forward to the new heavens and new earth. A land full of righteousness where there is no sin, no sorrow, no pain, and no barrier to obeying you humbly as your children. Oh, how grateful we are for Christ. And even as we go out into the world during the week, may this Christ cause us to rejoice and glory in this salvation that we have, bought with a price as we who have been redeemed. We have been ransomed and redeemed, ransomed from Satan and the kingdom of darkness, redeemed from you and your wrath. Because by nature we are children of wrath. And we have been called into this peculiar holy nation, the kingdom of light, and called your sons. And by the spirit who dwells in us, we can cry out, Abba, Father, because you are our heavenly Father. So be with us in the coming week. Help us as we go out. Help us as we speak with others. May we do so in a way that honors you and glorifies you. And even as we point them to Christ who was born, but did not remain a baby, but even as a baby was worshipped, was honoured, and receives all the glory. 
may we glorify Christ in our thought, in our intentions, in our speech, in our works. This is our prayer in his name. Amen. Amen. Glory, glory to our King, crowns unfading, wreath his head. Jesus is the name we sing, Jesus risen from the dead, Jesus conquer o'er the grave. Jesus mighty now to save. Jesus is gone up on high. Angels come to meet their King. Shouts triumphant rend the sky. While the victors praise they sing, open now ye heavenly gates. Tis the King of glory waits. Now behold him high and throned. Glory be from his face by adoring angels owned God of holiness and grace oh for hearts and tongues to sing glory glory to our King Jesus on thy people shine, warm our heart and tune our hands, that with angels we may join, share their bliss and swell their songs. Glory, honor, praise, and power, Lord, be thine forevermore. Amen. Benediction comes from First Thessalonians, chapter five, twenty-three and twenty-four. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who also will do it. Amen. 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 The Lord be with you in the coming week. Uh, we'll have a communion just after the service, in about five minutes. Uh, and so I would ask those who are born again and baptized and in good standing in their local churches, uh, they're the only ones who are invited to communion. May the Lord be with you uh, during the coming week. I have to immediately, I think some of the items and then we start, we just have uh, communion. Yeah. Mm. So, so I think, I'm going to Hey, how are you? Why are you crying? Thank you.
Luca. I don't stay Luca. Stay with Luca because Daddy has to prepare. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.